scris câteva cărți despre machine learning, una din ele fiind Machine Learning Book Camp, ce joc de cuvinte interesant, o carte pentru inginerii software care vor să înceapă să înțeleagă machine learning. Alexei, can you hear us? And you can hear me? Yes, perfect. How are you? I am good. Uh, how are you? Great. Uh, we are ready to start our second um, keynote. So the the scene is all yours if you're ready. Ah, I am. Actually, I thought it starts uh, in 10 minutes. What? Um... Ah, 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. here I'm, my... I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Okay. So let okay. me share my screen. It says oh in two minutes. We're two minutes earlier, so I guess okay. it's. Can you see my screen? Yes. Should I start? Of course. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. So thanks uh, for joining us today. So I do not speak Romanian, unfortunately. So this talk will be in English. Um, so uh, yeah. So my name is Alexei. I think I was introduced already, so I will skip that part. And today we will talk about serverless deep learning. So and after this talk, you will know how you can classify 1 million images using deep learning just for $16.66. Uh, so this is this is what you will learn today. And I work at Elix. Um, Elix is actually a very large company, so I work at Elix Group. On this picture, you see Elix India. And I work, actually, I don't work for um, Elix India. I work for European Elix. I usually use this slide because it's in English. Uh, the next slide I have is in Ukrainian, um, but I think you saw a similar picture, except uh, for uh, instead of Kirillix, you saw uh, Latin characters. So in uh, Romania, I think everything looks the same. So this is uh, where I work, Elix Group. So we focus uh, on uh, European markets, mostly where I work. So it's Poland, uh, Ukraine, Romania, Portugal, and uh, a couple of other countries. And imagine a scenario that uh, so we have all these pictures. So you see, like every um, every ad, every listing has a picture, right? And imagine a scenario that we want to classify each of these pictures. So we want to understand that we have a bike. So here, this is a bike. So we want to classify this image into um, like we want to say that there is a bike on this image, and likewise, there is a car on this image, or there is a uh, like, I, don't, I don't know what is this <laughs> like a, uh, like basically understand what like here's a box uh, like here's weird thing um, yeah so we want to be able to understand what is on each picture and uh, so I work as a data scientist and imagine I come up with a model for that so I use deep learning I train a model so the model is ready and then I come to an engineer and say um, and of course, everything happens uh, via uh, Zoom these days. So we chat to each other and uh, I say, I have a model and I want to deploy this model. Can you please help me? And then the engineer is, is like, okay, yes, I can help you. But do you know how to actually deploy models? Uh, because maybe uh, the engineer hasn't done this before. And then I say, yeah. Um, I read a blog post about this, and here this is how you can do this. And then, uh, like, you have a client, metadata service, a lot of queues, like a lot of uh, different uh, services. Uh, like, we use TensorFlow serving, we use MMS, uh, which is um, MXNet model service. So, and then you show this, um, I show this big picture, and then the engineer is like, What is that? Like, how on earth we are going to implement that? Because what engineer thinks at this moment is that this is a very complex system. It will require six people and it will require uh, six months to actually implement something like that. So it's a lot of work. And uh, I know that because actually this picture that I showed, this is something that we at Elix did at some point for serving deep learning models. And this is how much uh, time it actually took. It took time of six people, people of the entire team and uh, it took half a year to actually to deploy this thing and tune it and uh, do the, do all that. So this is a lot of work. And then of course, engineer is like, okay, this is uh, this is just too much. Is there a simpler way? 
and then um, so as a data scientist i can go to the internet and then find this thing called serverless which is supposed to be simpler right so you don't need to have all the servers you just you know the function is deployed somewhere and it's just used and then you don't need to care about all this infrastructure and this seems cool right so engineer is happy the scientists are happy um, so this is great and this is what we will actually talk about today. So we will talk about serverless and one particular implementation of that idea in AWS. Uh, uh, we will talk about Lambda. So we will talk how to actually deploy our deep learning models using AWS Lambda. Then we will talk about some limitations. Then we will talk about edge computing because I thought maybe there are not enough uh, buzzwords in this uh, presentation yet. So I wanted to, sc to sprinkle more buzzwords. So we'll talk about edge computing and you will see what does it have to do with uh, the presentation today. And then late, the last, lastly, we will talk about uh, uh, a relatively new approach. I think it's one year old, like adding Docker, um, serving Docker images uh, with Lambda. So that's uh, roughly the plan. And for those who don't know, Lambda is a way to deploy your things, your services without worrying about servers. So this is where this idea of serverless comes from. So you don't think about servers, you just write some code, right? So this is in this example, you write some Python code. So you just write some code and then you just click a button and then it gets automatically deployed. You don't need to worry about all this, uh, I don't know if you use Kubernetes, you don't need to worry about ports, services, and whatnot. It just magically deploys this code somewhere. So this is what we want to have. This is what we want to use. And um, you can think, like, okay, so this sounds cool. I'll just take my TensorFlow model that I trained before, and I will deploy it to Lambda, right? So the idea is we have a picture. This picture goes to our Lambda function that we write. So this Lambda function one function goes to S3, which is a file storage in AWS. It fetches the model from there, the model we trained, uh, data scientist trained, TensorFlow model in this case. And then it uses this model to make a prediction to say that on this picture we have, um, so this is a picture of a pack, uh, which is the, the grid of this doc, right? And then, so this is what we want to do. And everyone is happy. The engineer is happy, the data scientists are happy, right? because now it's just one simple Lambda function. We don't need uh, to have all this complex infrastructure, right? So let's do that. So we write our um, function, right? So in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Lambda, you need to have this handler function, right? Which takes some, that's basically where the logic lives. Um, so you load your model outside of this uh, function or uh, handler function, function. You load your model there, and then you do you download the image, whatever. So this URL is the URL of the image, URL of this uh, uh, of this picture, right? So you download the image, then you apply the model to this image using this predict, which is implemented somewhere here. I'm just I don't just show it, and then you decode the prediction, and then you return this to the user. So looks simple, right? So let's implement that. And then what you need to do, you usually in Python, uh, for those who use Python, you know that there is this requirements txt file, which usually contains all the libraries you have. Sorry. Uh, all the libraries you have, um, like because you need to have TensorFlow, you need to have NumPy, you need to have all these libraries that uh, you depend on. So you need to package all these libraries into one zip file. And this is approximately how it looks like, right? So you get all your requirements, then you copy the actual file with your logic, and then you package everything in a zip file, and it should work, supposedly. But there are some limits. So, and the, the main limit in Lambda, which was changed recently with Docker that we will talk about a bit later, but basically, if you want to use this, just upload a zip file with dependencies, then um, the limits is like, uh, it should be 50 megabytes zipped file, right? And if you think about TensorFlow, like this is actually the old version, which is like three years old or something like this, I don't remember, which is already above this limit, right? 
this is already then 250 max. And um, yeah, it's also possible to use the old one, right? So you just take this image, uh, take this, uh, um, take this library, and then there are some tutorials online that you can find uh, that tells you how to actually deduce the size of this old TensorFlow to actually meet the limit. And it involves a lot of hacks. I will not go into details, but yeah, you do that. And then it fits the limits and until you find out that you actually need to use a more recent version of TensorFlow. And it's instead of 350, uh, megabytes it's um, like almost two gigs and there is no way you can reduce this using any um, anything like that right so no matter what you do it will always be above limits right so what to do in this case right when uh, the latest tensorflow is just too huge you cannot just go and deploy it this doesn't work so uh, yeah doesn't mean that we need to go back to uh, this uh, Frankenstein monster and uh, you know spend six months uh, on developing something or there is something easier. Okay, let's take a look at what are the actual what are the other options? What we can do instead of uh, going back and uh, implementing this complex infrastructure. So there is a thing called TensorFlow for JavaScript. It's called TensorFlow JS. Perhaps we can use this or there's also TensorFlow for Java. Maybe this could be an option. Then there is another library called TensorFlow Serving, um, which is written in C++. It's very small, like it's uh, 50 megabytes. Maybe it will work. Or there's another thing called TensorFlow Lite. Maybe this option. So let's see. So TensorFlow J JavaScript is actually quite small. So it fits within the limits, but uh, the main uh, problem with this is JavaScript, right? So we data scientists usually code in uh, Python. So there are libraries that we use for pre-processing, for post-processing, for doing everything during training. And uh, if we want to use JavaScript, TensorFlow JavaScript, it means that we will need to re-implement everything from scratch in JavaScript. And um, yeah, so this is uh, something that, um, so, I wasn't brave enough to actually to start doing this uh, as a Python developer. So JavaScript is like alien language to me. So that was more like, you know, uh, like it's uh, maybe there is something better, right? So let's check. Then TensorFlow Serving, it fits within limits. And uh, at Olix, we already know how to use TensorFlow Serving because remember this big uh, architecture I showed, it, there was a, a box with TensorFlow on it. So we already knew how to use this, but it was not clear how to actually put this inside inside Lambda. And then the other thing was that it's C++. There is no way to use Python there. And uh, again, we have the same trouble, like how do we actually, you know, if it works in Lambda, how do we rewrite all this code in C++, which looked like, yeah, maybe there's something better. And then the last option we talked, uh, I mentioned was TensorFlow Lite. And TensorFlow Lite, if you look it up, it says this is machine learning for mobile and edge devices. So this is interesting, right? So mobile and edge devices, what is actually what is that actually, right? Um, and then um, so when you click on this link, you can see that okay, TensorFlow Lite runs on mobile phones, embedded Linux Linux devices, and microcontrollers. And the interesting thing here is embedded Linux devices or more like Linux devices, because Lambda is actually a Linux device, if you think about this. So it uses Amazon Linux to do some things. And what is more, you can use TensorFlow Lite with C++ and Python. So we don't care much about C++, but the Python part is interesting, right? Because this is what we need. So we want to run something in Python and we want to use Linux. So it seems like it's something worth exploring. So when you go there, you see this is actually, uh, this picture is a bit outdated. There are newer versions of this, but you see that there is actually a wheel package. So this is just a way of, uh, you know, packaging your libraries in Python called wheel. Um, so there are already packaged wheels there that you can just get installed and use this. So this is amazing. Um, I thought, I thought let's try it. But then the first thing that happened was, uh, like when I put this and upload this to Lambda, it was saying something like this. 
which was quite cryptic. Like I had no idea what it means. But then I figured out that it actually means that this version was compiled for Debian-based systems like Ubuntu. But what uh, Lambda uses is Amazon Linux, which is a CentOS-based uh, Linux, right? And then they don't, uh, it's not, uh, how to say, it's not portable. You cannot just take something compiled for one Linux and put it to another uh, Linux and expect it to work, which is what happened here. So here it means that we need to recompile uh, TensorFlow Lite for this specific platform, for this specific, um, so for CentOS-based uh, distributions, Linux distributions, and in particular for Amazon Linux. And um, yeah, basically this is what you do. So you can, you don't have to install CentOS or anything like this. You can do this from Docker. So Amazon Linux is actually available on Docker Hub. So what you do is you just write a Docker file, then you do from Amazon Linux, and then you have Amazon Linux exactly the same environment as you have on Lambda. And then you take TensorFlow Lite and compile it. So you install all these G++ and all these things, install there, compile it, and just take the, the wheel uh, out of there. And when you do that, it uh, turns out that actually TensorFlow Lite is very small. So this is, uh, like, remember I said that uh, TensorFlow, the usual one, 2.2 is 1.7 gigabytes. But TensorFlow Lite 2.2 is only 6 megabytes. And I don't think it's packed. So it's not packed yet. So then if you zip this, you get a 20 megabyte uh, zip file with all the dependencies. So you already have NumPy there. You have Peel, which is uh, like a library for image manipulation in Python. And then you have TensorFlow Lite. And this is all you need for deploying a deep learning model. So it's a lot lighter. You don't need to uh, figure out how to get this TensorFlow monster inside your Lambda. So you use TensorFlow Lite. And then this is what TensorFlow Lite, uh, this is what Lambda with TensorFlow Lite responds. It means that uh, you don't get this error message. It means that it works. So cool. Right, uh, a few things. Um, so yeah, maybe just to summarize. So what do you do is you use TensorFlow Lite. So then uh, what I didn't mention is you need to convert your TensorFlow model into TensorFlow Lite, which is like one line of code or two. I don't remember. So very tiny. So then you do this, then you upload your model to S3. Then you uh, package all these dependencies uh, using, uh, remember I showed you uh, like pip install requirements and then specify the folder where you want to install all the requirements. So you do this and then you package everything in, inside a zip file. And this is what you use to actually deploy to, um, to Lambda. And it works, right? Um, so to make it work, um, you need to increase timeout. So default one is very small. So it's not enough time to actually load the model. Uh, or load TensorFlow Lite. So you need to give it uh, uh, more time. So one minute, for example, and you need to give it more uh, memory. So the default limit of 128 uh, megabytes is not sufficient. You need to give it at least uh, 500 uh, megabytes. And yeah, so this should be sufficient to actually uh, to load um, this model. And um, when you do the first request, so when you already did this uh, plate with limits. So the first request takes around three minutes, uh, three seconds, sorry, which is uh, you know, like maybe not super fast, but it's okay. But this is the first request. And then when you send the second request to Lambda, it warms up. So the first request takes some time because it needs to load everything. But then the second and subsequent uh, requests, they are much faster, right? And um, yeah, here on this slide, I put different, um, uh, like how the amount of RAM you give to your Lambda function uh, depends like how it affects the speed. So the more RAM you give, the faster your requests are. Um, so for example, if you give 1.5 gigabytes of uh, RAM, then it's quite fast, right? It's um, like three times, uh, almost three times faster than uh, 500 megabytes. Okay, so this is how you do this. And uh, one year ago, approximately, Amazon 
released a major update to the way you do lambdas, uh, the, the way you create lambdas in uh, AWS. So they added Docker support. And this is really a cool thing. So I just want to mention a few things about that as well. So in uh, like when you create the Lambda function, you can choose now instead of um, so previously we would author from scratch and we would upload a zip file, but now you can create a container image and put all the dependencies instead of putting them inside a zip file and uploading them, you can put everything in a container. Of course, container has to be um, um, compatible with Lambda. So it should be one of the Lambda containers. And this is roughly how it looks like uh, when you want to deploy something with Lambda. So you first extend from um, like one of the base images from Amazon. So in this example, it was Python 3.7. Then you get your requirements, you install them. And then separately, you also install TensorFlow Lite that is compiled for, for this specific uh, Linux distribution, uh, for this specific Python version. So this is something that I showed you that uh, you can compile TensorFlow Lite yourself. So this is actually it. Then you copy. Um, you don't have to copy. You can also upload this to S3. Uh, but you can just put this inside image as well. So. Um, because limits with Docker container, they're a bit better than, uh, you know, with just the zip file. So you can put your model there. You, you need to convert this model from TensorFlow to TensorFlow Lite. And then the actual file that you, um, you wrote, like the actual Python script. And then you specify that uh, the, the Lambda handler lives in this Python file, which is index.py, and the function that processes um, the request is called handler. Right, and that's it. And that's enough for, to actually deploy things. Okay, so that's uh, this is how you should, uh, like if you want to use Docker, this is how you do this, but the rest um, doesn't change. Of course, here, theoretically, you can add the big TensorFlow with 1.7 gigabytes, because I think for Docker, the limit is five gigs. But it's not something you want to put in your production system because loading such an image will take a lot of time. So you 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 want to have smaller images, and uh, like if your image is small, then the first request to Lambda will be quite fast. So that's why um, everything I showed you still uh, is still valid for uh, for the case of Docker. So, okay, now let's talk a bit about the cost. So this is something I showed you at the beginning and I promised I will show you how to, how you can score, how you can classify 1 million images for $16, for $17. So this is the cost and uh, the way I calculated it. Uh, so here I took um, this 124 megabytes and then uh, one, uh, 1,000 uh, milliseconds per request. And then I multiply it to you by one million. So there is a pricing calculator uh, somewhere in uh, AWS. And this is how I arrived at this uh, number. I think, yeah, I have a breakdown here. So for um, one gig, for one million requests, uh, you need to pay like 17 bucks. Then um, for half a gigabyte of RAM, like it's um, it's cheaper, but it's slower. That's why at the end the price is the same. But if you want to be a bit faster, uh, you can get more. You can add more RAM, and then your price will increase as well. So this is roughly the cost, um, which doesn't seem like too expensive, right? But if you think about, um, so let's say if we think about Oilix, so at Oilix, users produce approximately 10 million images per day. So if, you, if we want to classify all these 10 million images into different classes, so we want to apply a model to all these images, then the cost will be $16 times 10, which is already $166, which is um, like not insignificant, right? And then this is just for one day, but we have 30 days in a month. And when you multiply, it means that a system like that will cost five uh, five thousand dollars per month, which is uh, yeah, it gets quite expensive, right? So if you think about scale, 
So then with a lot of images, you need to also to pay a lot of money. And now if we compare it with this system that I showed you at the very beginning, the cost for this system is approximately $500 per month per model, which is significantly cheaper um, for this lot. But then again, you have a trade-off. Like if you just want to score to have a prototype and score like classify 1 million images, then you don't need this uh, monster, right? That you will develop for six months. Um, but if you're talking about like a production system that takes a lot of load each day, then you need to invest in infrastructure, right? And then it makes sense to spend some time uh, also like for people to invest their time. And then at the end, you will have something that is cheaper, but means it needs constant maintenance, unlike Lambda, where you just write a function, throw it inside this uh, serverless thing, and it just works. OK, so this is like a short summary of uh, what we talked about. So there are many benefits, uh, advantages of using Lambda. So it's easy to deploy. It's serverless. You don't need to worry about servers. Then it scales down to zero, meaning that if there is no traffic coming to your um, to your service, to your model, then you're not charged. While let's say if it's a Kubernetes based, and then you have already, you always have to have at least one instance running, then you're always paying, right? So in case of Lambda, if there is no traffic, you don't pay anything. And it's great for small load. Like let's say if you need to um, do a proof of concept for some, I don't know, 1 million images or less, then it's great. But uh, yeah, it gets expensive for high load. Like let's say if you need to score to classify 10 million images daily, then it, um, it becomes difficult. Um, then there are some disadvantages. Like initially, it was not straightforward. Maybe if you look at this presentation, it looks easy. But uh, like um, it wasn't easy when I was doing this for the first time. So I needed to figure out a lot of things, especially when Docker was not available. So like, it took a lot of uh, time to figure things out. So it wasn't as straightforward. And then um, let's say at Twilix, we use different, uh, so we don't use CloudWatch. This is a thing for monitoring from AWS. We don't use it, we use other systems for monitoring. And then uh, for us, the disadvantage was like, how do we get the metrics that CloudWatch produces and put it to, let's say, our Prometheus or something else, right? So it wasn't uh, super straightforward to do that. We eventually figured that out. But yeah, it was something that well, also worth keeping in mind, like how easy would it be for you to monitor your system um, or whether you will need to monitor it at all. If it's just one uh, time proof of concept and you use it once and throw away, it's fine. But if it's something that should be constantly running, then you need to invest in monitoring as well. And then last thing, there is some undocumented behavior. So when I was using, uh, when I was using Lambda, sometimes I noticed that it becomes slower for no reasons. And then, uh, yeah, so why is it slower? It's not clear. Documentation doesn't say why. So it could be because uh, of uh, it's called noisy neighbors. Maybe somebody else is uh, running a lot of stuff and uh, like in the same region as you, and they are taking a lot of machines. And uh, yeah, so your workloads suffer because of that. Or one instance was that um, my uh, Lambda function started to uh, produce a lot of errors. And for some reasons, if there are errors in your code, uh, your Lambda functions become uh, slower. Right? And what I needed to do was that uh, I had a try accept, and then I locked these errors, and then magically it became 10 times faster. And of course, there is no documentation about that. So it's uh, like sometimes you're on your own and you need to play with uh, this thing. Um, but this is the cost of uh, you know, having a managed solution. So this is like comparison. Uh, and then, then the main takeaway from this presentation is uh, so serving deep learning without investing upfront into a lot of infrastructure is possible. So you can do it with serverless, with Lambda. You can deploy your proof of concept relatively easy without a lot of effort. And uh, while TensorFlow 2 is heavy, there are lighter versions, this TensorFlow Lite, and this is something you can use to actually deploy your deep learning models to uh, Lambda. So this is what I meant when I said 
edge computing to rescue. So Lambda is not edge computing, but TensorFlow Lite is a library for running on devices. So that's why it optimized and it's light and it can be used outside of edge computing devices, like outside of mobile. You can put this in Lambda and uh, use it. Then Docker makes it simpler. So it should be it, sorry, not this. Uh, um, so you saw this Docker file, more, it's not uh, that complex. So just go ahead and try. I think you'll like it. Uh, if you haven't, um, yeah, it, it's really not that difficult. And then the final thing is uh, AWS Lambda is really good for small load, but it becomes expensive under high load. So at some point when your proof of concept is no longer a proof of concept, it makes sense to invest, uh, in, actually invest in infrastructure. Okay, so if you actually want to try this thing, like after watching this, you want to, like it's, um, I guess slides, uh, having slides is not sufficient to try. So all the code is actually available. And uh, like I'll, like a sh shameless plug here. So this, what I showed you is also a part of a book I wrote. So it's called Machine Learning Bootcamp, which is a book for software engineers who want to get into data science, uh, into machine learning. And one of the chapters there is about that, serverless deep learning. And you have all the code, everything I presented here in this repo. So I think it's chapter seven. So if you just click on this link, go to chapter seven, you will find all the code um, from this talk there. And then finally, we are hiring. If you're interested uh, in, at, in working at Elix Group, check our careers page. Uh, I think we're also hiring in Romania. Uh, it depends on different positions, but uh, check it out. If you see a position that is, uh, let's say, in Germany or Lisbon or, or in Germany or Portugal or Poland, but you think you're qualified for that position, you can still apply because I am pretty sure since we have um, also an office in Romania, I'm pretty sure we should be able to hire there as well. So yeah, if you are not sure, just apply. Um, if you see in interesting position and we will we'll take it from there. If you have any questions to me, you can of course ask now and I'm happy to answer. But if you want to connect with me after the talk, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter. So this is, these are my main uh, ways to contact me. And of course you can join Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data and you can find me there. So if you want to write me, that's the best way. Uh, to actually reach out to me is data docs club slack but if you want to follow me you can do this on uh, linkedin and twitter i think this is the last slide um so yeah um if there are questions i'm happy to answer them now i think there are some questions in the, in the chat uh, can you see the chat or do you want us to, to read them to you? So should I open it? Mm, well, one of the question was, uh, what was the hardest thing for you when uh, you started learning, uh, started learning machine learning? So for me, the hardest thing was to, um, like when I was reading um, machine learning books, like I saw all these formulas and that was um, scary and uh, trying to understand that these formulas are not scary. Um, I think that was the most difficult thing. And work, what worked for me is uh, trying to translate these formulas to actually code and then seeing them in code is not as um, scary anymore. And uh, you can translate practically every formula into Python code or whatever language you're comfortable with. And then you see that matrix multiplication is nothing else but three for loops. And then this thing uh, becomes all of a sudden becomes less uh, complex. At least this is how it happened to me. Um, and then getting experience, I think, was also like developing intuition when machine learning is uh, useful, when it's not. And then I think there is no shortcut here. You just need to do as many projects as, uh, as possible and then get experience. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the, the answer. Uh, I think we also have a question. If uh, TensorFlow Lite uh, supports all the capabilities of TensorFlow 2, and if so, if uh, should one expect some challenges due to the conversion from uh, TensorFlow to TensorFlow Lite? So um, TensorFlow Lite only can be used for serving models. So you cannot train a model with TensorFlow Lite. 
right? So let's say you already train a model with TensorFlow and now you're thinking how you can actually put it, let's say on your mobile or inside a Lambda function or whatever. So with TensorFlow Lite, you can do pretty much the same thing as with TensorFlow when it comes to applying models. Uh, and actually you can do more. So with TensorFlow Lite, you can also um, reduce the size of your models by losing some accuracy. You can do this with TensorFlow Lite. Um, but yeah, when it comes to, you know, just taking a TensorFlow model and converting it to TensorFlow Lite, uh, I don't think you should expect any challenges. Um, well, one thing is it's, uh, you need to do it once to see how it actually works, like how you can actually invoke a TensorFlow Lite model. It's a bit different from usual TensorFlow, but once you have done this at least once, um, yeah, I don't think you will have any problems. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your answer, Alexei. Do we have any other questions? If you have any questions, please write them in the chat. Uh, I have another question. Uh, what, uh, for someone, how, what else can be used instead of TensorFlow? Is it something else you recommend? Yeah, like if you are talking about um, deep learning, then there is a library called PyTorch that is quite popular these days. Um, yeah, so you can try that. Uh, although when it comes to training models, PyTorch is probably easier than TensorFlow. But when it comes to serving models afterward, uh, afterwards, when it's training, uh, when it's trained already, and you want to serve it, PyTorch is still lagging a bit behind. So TensorFlow serving has been around for quite a while, but with PyTorch serving, uh, it's not as uh, mature yet, I think. But I know many companies already use PyTorch in production and uh, it's not a problem for them. So yeah, so I guess the main alternative would be PyTorch and uh, just try them both and see what works for you. And then maybe another bit of advice for TensorFlow. So you probably don't want to use plain TensorFlow. I, use, you, I usually use Keras, which is a, like an abstraction on top of TensorFlow, which makes things easier. So if you want to get started with uh, deep learning, I suggest to use Keras instead of plain TensorFlow. Um, and yeah, or PyTorch, for example. Uh, a good beginner's book um, it, that you recommend beside yours? Uh, okay, that's... <laughs> uh, yeah, I do not know actually. Um, so I know that there is a good course on Coursera from Andrew Eng from, uh, from Stanford University. It's called Machine Learning. So yeah, if I have to recommend anything, I would recommend that because it's a, it's a great course. Um, yeah, it's a bit old. So it's, um, I don't know, nine years old, but it's really good. Um, so if you want to, especially, so my book is focused on um, hands-on. So it's, it's for engineers who want to first get their hands dirty and then figure out how things work. And uh, if you really want to figure out how things work, you then uh, take the course from Andrew Eng from Stanford because he explains many things that I do not, like many uh, like uh, simpler mathematics, for example. Um, I don't get into many details about that. But in that course, you will learn uh, learn these things. So um, yeah, they probably work well together. Um, apart from that, um, yeah, I don't know. Good. What's a, a routine you can change? I, it, it doesn't. I, I don't think it has something to do with your uh, with your presentation. But what's a uh, a certain thing you can uh, improve with in your day by day life if you use machine learning? What you can improve, um, yeah, so usually, um, so when I train a model, so like um, I'm just trying to, to think, so when you train a model, usually uh, when training a model, you need to try many different things. So there is a, a neural net, then you can have many different neural networks, many different parameters, and then it's a lot of, uh, it's very exploratory pro process. Right, so you try many different things and what helps to stay sane and remember what actually works and what doesn't is somehow tracking all these experiments. 
And um, I think one thing that uh, if somebody who is a data scientist who is listening for this right now, um, maybe one advice to improve the way you do this is to start using some tracking tools like MLflow. They allow to, um, for, to, to do experiments and uh, like you experiment, you train one version of a model, then you log this, and then you have a nice web interface where you see, okay, this is my one, one, 100 experiments that I run. This is the accuracy for these models. And then you can select the best models and you can select the best parameters. While usually I, for example, the five years ago, I was doing this all manually without using any tool. So yeah, maybe use tools for tracking experiments. This is something that uh, really helped me at some point. I, I don't know if I answered your question, but no, uh, it is. But uh, and did you uh, made yourself some uh, this kind of machines for your day by day work? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, so if you uh, you gave an example of a scientist mm -hmm. uh, with this, do you use any tools like this? You've made by yourself? Oh, so there is a tool called MLflow. Yeah, so it's uh, an open source tool. It's quite popular there is a very active community um so yeah i would recommend to use that um so what i used before was uh first uh excel excel spreadsheets i would put each experiment in excel spreadsheet and then see what is the best model but of course it's very prone to errors and uh, yeah use some of all alexei thank you very much for your time uh, great presentation and thank you again for uh, for spending your time with us and sharing your knowledge uh, and I hope uh, we get to see you in the next uh, PIT editions. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure talking here.